This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, Detroit sports fans? Welcome back to the Fan Report, a show made by fans for fans, powered by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and this is my boy Anderson. Right across from me is going to give us this week's topics. So this week we're going to continue our draft coverage series and evaluate potential Lions prospects at the cornerback and linebacker position. We're also going to check on the pulse of the Pistons playoff push and reminisce on the good old days of the Golden World Crew. So let's get into it. All right, so you heard the man, the man, the myth, the legend, my boy Andrew right here. You heard him. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling uh, nostalgic today. Feeling nostalgic. We'll get, um, we'll get nostalgic to close We'll get into the show. some nostalgia at the end of the show. Yeah. Just to kind of uh, end on a high note. You know, a little feel good so stuff. I, but I have a feeling the Pistons section of the show is going to be a little bit dour. <laughs> to say the least, my friend. To say the least. Um, but. Not much positivity to take from this <laughs> No, no, not much at all. You, when you lose four straight, there's not much positives to look yeah. at. Um, Seven or last nine. Like, it's. It's, it's ugly. ugly ball right now. Mm-hmm. They're getting they. You know, you're supposed to get hot at the end of your season, moving on into the playoffs, and they've done. Quite did you hear what they the said opposite. about? But did you hear they said about Blake Griffin Day? What Dwayne Case said about Blake Griffin? No. What did he say? He said that his knees at a point where playing him is not going to make it any worse. The hell does that mean? I don't know, but it defies all I, logic to me. I, yeah, <laughs> I would argue that playing him, he like jumps and lands awkwardly because he doesn't have enough strength in, in it. Like it, it tears his ACL. That's arguably worse. Yeah, that arguably it is worse. No, I know it's objectively worse. <laughs> yes, objectively worse. There we go. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways, though, so let's go ahead and start with the Lions uh, this mm-hmm. week. Uh, I believe we did that last week, yeah. actually. Uh, so we can uh, kind of get that out of the way, and then we'll move on into uh, the Pistons because we do have a lot more to talk about with them. But as you guys uh, caught on our last uh, our last podcast from last week, we had the draft positional breakdown of pass rushers, and this week we're looking at cornerbacks and linebackers. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of uh, true first round talent at each position, and by linebackers we mean inside line, interior linebackers, not the outside guys that are rushing the passer. These are interior guys, your mics, your wills, your coverage guys, mm-hmm. your, your your east west kind of guys, like a Leighton Van Der Esch, so to speak. Um, but you know, there's only a couple of names there, so we decided to group in the corners with them because there's only a few names there as well. And and you'll see us do this kind of on a week to week basis with some of these. Uh, other position groups also. Uh, the pass rush was just loaded with talent. Yeah, that's why we uh, took so much on. That was why we took one day to do them. Um, but it's probably the most loaded position group of this first round. I'll be honest. It's probably the most loaded position group in the draft. It, it, it very. I haven't really evaluated is. the back end of the draft, but <laughs> true. Um, but do you want to start with corners or linebackers? Let's start with corners. Corners. All right. So we got three prospects here. That are really even mentioned in first as first round prospects. You obviously have another guy like Justin Lane, whose name is kind of thrown in the back end of that first in and out. You know, first round, second round, even third round. I've seen him as late. Uh, so we won't, won't really get into him too much. Now, a lot of these options are situations where you know the reports came out today that the Lions are very aggressively trying to trade back in this draft. This is a situation where the Lions could trade back and get any yeah. of these three guys. Were there a bias reports? I don't know. But I don't either. I don't either. Um, I, I don't know for sure. In that same interview, Robert Quinn also said that he is... Robert pers- Quinn? I call him Robert. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't think I've ever heard him referred until, to as Robert Quinn until, in this city. Until we made the playoffs, he's called that's, Robert. That's like <laughs> Matthew Patricia and John Matthew he, Stafford. He, he hasn't earned the nickname Bob yet from it. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough, but um, um, everything he's been, he before in that in that same interview he said how he was purposely spreading misinformation, and then like a few questions <laughs> later he says this. So how do we know this isn't misinformation? <laughs> uh, why do they, why do they got to be so damn secret about everything in this city, dude? If I was a GM, I'd purposely be spreading misinformation too. I mean, I guess, but at this at some point you got to oh, be at least a little bit transparent. Mm-hmm. A, a lack of transparency is is. Not necessarily a good thing. Oh, I'm not saying I, I, I'm not saying misinformation about everything. I'm just saying in just the draft. I'm I'd be ultra secret about my draft. So would you just like randomly call certain teams and be like, "Hey, you know, I'm looking to trade back," and then just never answer another phone call? Mm-hmm. 
or just like tease them with it. Be like, hey, I got the number eight pick here. You want it? Or, <laughs> or just, or just, and just put, dangle it there and never pull the trigger. Or, or just like if I'm if I'm looking if I'm actually looking to move back, like basically like tease like I'm ready to draft like a high end prospect. Other teams behind me want. And then so teams will try to trade I mean, that's me. that's just standard yeah. practice right there. <laughs> that's nothing special. You're not, like, throwing your draft pick out on a dance pole and on, <laughs> on a platform stage and saying, come get it, boys. You know, you're not doing that at that point. Um, but anyways, so we do have three guys here, three names that are honestly, to a lot of different scouts, interchangeable. I, I've seen, you know, any one of these names be the top guy as well as be the bottom guy. Um, you know, the primarily the one who is stuck near the top for the most part is the corner from the from LSU and Greedy Williams, mm-hmm. who has very, very high top end speed. You ran a four three seven at the combine and in, in the 40 time. Um, he's got decent size. He's six foot one, 185. There is one big knock against him, though, and it's the inability to tackle. Mm -hmm. And at this level, at the NFL level, that's that's kind of a big red flag. If you can't tackle at this level, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Fantastic coverage corner, arguably the best coverage corner in this draft. He can can blink it, guys. Oh, absolutely. I mean, kind of reminiscent of Revis Island, so to say. You know, I've heard those comparisons a little bit. His route recognition is probably... Absolutely fantastic. Maybe maybe second best, maybe best in this draft. You could argue you could argue that Byron Murphy is a better route than he yes, is. Yes, I but in terms of a straight up man to man single Byron coverage Murphy's corner. Not as quick as Greedy no, Williams, and that's so. what I'm saying. In a straight up man to man single coverage corner, mm-hmm. Greedy Williams is probably the best in this draft yeah, in that respect. I agree. Um So it depends. You got, if you got there's it. any team that is looking to draft him though, they're gonna need a mm-hmm. safety behind him who is a very sure tackler. Someone who or a linebacker who's able to move around a lot and make tackles in the open field. Mm-hmm. With speed, so uh, there's there's deficiencies here, and that's a big reason why I've seen him as high as in the top ten to dropping all the way back to the you know the twenty in, in the twenties. Mm-hmm. I've seen him all over draft yeah, boards. He's all over for the reason of he can't tackle because his positives are very positive. His negatives are pretty Ma- major, <laughs> big negatives. Yeah. If he can't tackle in the NFL, that's that's a major red flag. Yeah, um, I like Greedy Williams a lot. I know he's someone who's been mocked to the Lions quite a bit. I don't know if I like him here, though, because, again, you need one of those big time tackling safeties to be able to be that safety blanket in the almost guaranteed situation that Greedy Williams misses a tackle because it's going to happen. So you need that safety blanket back there that's going to be able to make a tackle. Lions don't really have the exterior linebackers to to make up for those deficiencies. And the safety play is good, not great. I love Glover, uh, Glover Quinn's gun. I loved Quandre Diggs. Mm-hmm. Tracy Walker is a big question mark. Yeah. I'm not willing to take that risk right now. I'm not. Not at not at number eight. Not even if we, we trade back. Uh, we have more pressing needs in my migraine. We do need a, a secondary corner, but we did mm-hmm. bring in uh, Justin Coleman. Mm-hmm. So we did kind of fill in a need there. But Green Williams is a fantastic coverage corner, but it's not a good fit for this system right yeah. now based on the fact that we don't have a Cam Chancellor in the back. We don't have, you know, a vintage Roy Williams when he was with back in the Cowboys day mm-hmm. when he was just obliterating everybody. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that name back there in the Cowboys <laughs> secondary. Well, easily one of my favorite safeties ever I've ever watched play football. Man was a pounder. He just knew how to lay the hit down. You know my single favorite Lions corner is of all time? Who? Trey Bly. You know, I'm going to agree with you, <laughs> although he never really liked it here that much. Well, I didn't say he liked it here, but watching him pick oh, up his arm was, in a club Yeah, was watching brilliant. him play was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. The I will say, though, Darius Slay is slowly creeping his way up there. He's, he's yeah. slowly getting there yeah. to where I'm I'm almost ready to say that he's overtaken Trey Bly yeah. and my personal favorite yeah. Lions corner. Um, uh, let's move on to the second corner, though. Um, you dang, you even got nothing to say about Greedy? I mean, you you covered every single point. <laughs> Fair enough. I can't really add much outside of what you just said. Um, if the Lions, uh, let me ask you this. Yes. If you're Bob Quinn, sorry, Robert Quinn <laughs> to you, if you are Bob Quinn sitting at that number eight spot and Greedy Williams is in your lap, do you take him? No. If you trade back to 12 or later and Greedy Williams is sitting so in your lap, is, do you this take is what him? I was going to say. I think the, the three quarterbacks we're going to discuss, 
I don't. I I'm not quite sure Greedy Williams falls, but I do. It's a very distinct possibility. I think he has very but high possibility we, to fall. In this if track. we were to trade down like the late teens, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. This is that's where the corners to me become relevant because then there is an actual decent chance that whatever corner falls to us may be the actual best player on the board. That's and very that's, entirely possible. And that's where I'll corners, be okay taking a corner. There are three corners on yeah. the draft boards that are first round talent, yeah. so there is a good possibility but, there. Now, the situation that I can honestly see first round talents for this draft, I would say, I would say for most drafts, these guys may be second round. Probably, corners. you're you're not wrong. Yeah. Um, this is not a very good draft yeah. for cornerbacks. Well, in in general, a lot of scouts have been saying that. After the twelfth, thirteenth pick, it's like second round talent. It's yeah. first round talent only goes to like top right. ten, maybe a couple extra. Um now there are some gems in the back and yeah, well, especially at O line, things like yeah. that. But in this draft, mm-hmm. you know, it, much like in other drafts, the one situation where I can see Gritty Gritty mm-hmm. Williams continue to fall down draft boards yeah. is a situation like what we see almost every single year where at least two quarterbacks go in the top ten because teams mm-hmm. trade up to get them. Which I think if will we happen see, again this year. I do too. If we see both um, Dwayne Haskins, I mean, there's no or, way sorry, Dwayne two Haskins. three quarterbacks yeah. up there. I have three quarterbacks mocked in the top ten. I have three quarterbacks mocked in the top fifteen, I believe. Mm-hmm. So I'm right there with you. But it, obviously, Kyler Murray, mm-hmm. Dwayne Haskins, and then if Drew Locke gets taken in that mm-hmm. top ten to fifteen range as well, you're going to see Gr- Rudy Williams fall. Yeah, because that means that guys like Montez Sweat, guys like mm-hmm. Devin Bush, guys like Devin White, mm-hmm. possibly. Yeah. Are gonna Clell and Farrell are gonna continue to fall on those draft boards, and they're gonna fall into laps of teams mm-hmm. that are gonna look at that board and say that's the best player available. He's he's should be he should have been gone already. Yeah. I have to take him. Well, in, in my I mean, I mean in my mock, I have Greedy Williams falling all the way to twenty one. I mean, <laughs> like it's very I mean it's very likely that he could fall pretty yeah. far down this draft board mm-hmm. because of a situation like that. So um, let's move on to uh, Byron Murphy. So Byron Murphy is. A very different player than Greedy Williams. He's almost oh, the opposite player. He uses his head a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, and he comes in a bit smarter than Greedy Williams at five eleven, ran a five five forty, so he's slower than Greedy. Uh, but, I have six foot one for Byron Murphy. Mm-mm. I have six one one eighty five again. I have I have I have five eleven with a four five five forty. I, didn't, I, I have didn't, the four five five forty. I did not take down the size, but uh, you know, I have five eleven one ninety. Is what I pulled up. I don't, he's not six one. There's no way Byron Murphy. Walter 6'1". Football has him listed as six one. So I'm going to verify that right here. <laughs> I'm going to verify that, but that's okay. Because what I was about to get at was one of Brian Murphy's uh, one of Byron Murphy's uh, big knocks is that four five five speed is not that that four five five speed with his with his lack of height is not a good combination. And, but the positive is he does play bigger than his side. He also shows really good quickness and change of direction. And he probably, in my opinion, from what I've seen, has the best route participation in this draft in terms of actual. Oh, there's no question about that. He definitely mm-hmm. has. He's one of the smartest corners in this draft. There's mm-hmm. no question. Yeah. He is someone that is able to jump a route a lot mm-hmm. better than most in than most, you know, defensive players yeah. here. He's a very solid zone coverage corner. He's a very vintage, you know, a guy that if you play a lot of zone, a lot of cover three, things like that, he's a guy who could be a very, mm-hmm. you know, solid corner in that respect. Mm-hmm. He's not the best man coverage corner because of the lack of size and speed, mm-hmm. but he is a fantastic guy who is able to play smart and jump the route. He can play man, mm-hmm. even press man, but he's a very solid zone corner as well. Well, even even then, like even in uh, even in man, he can. He can play man in short area coverage. So I don't know what Walter football's doing, but I've got his height <laughs> everywhere else five yeah, eleven. Yeah. Even in even in man, he can still play short area coverage. And he, he has can. Great, and the fact that uh, he actually showed a lot of ability in run support. Mm-hmm. That's why I think a lot of teams are looking at him as a as a top nickel in this draft, um, rather than uh, rather than a starting corner. That is a possibility of of as a nickel back for mm-hmm. him going in that spot, just because of his lack of size, yeah. lack of speed. You see mm-hmm. a lot of those shorter routes come mm-hmm. out of that, come out of that slot receiver position. Yeah. So that is a good place to utilize him in your defense, especially considering uh, you can play him there and be very comfortable that you're not going to get beat deep. Yeah. Um, you also have, again, a, an opportunity and to rod play him. Is important. Yes. And rod antici- anticipation is very important there. And he can help on the, in, you know, in the rushings mm-hmm. in, in, you know, delayed, delayed rush, draw plays, things like that, or even outside runs. But even in a situation where you play him in a cover three inside or outside, I mean, you've got, you know, s- you know, a very solid corner in that respect. He's a guy who I've seen jump ahead. He is a more sure tackler than greedy Williams. 
Uh, he's I've seen him jump ahead of Greedy Williams for the reason and the versatility that he has. I've also seen him fall out of the first round. Mm-hmm. So this is a guy that could honestly go anywhere. And if I'm the Lions, unless I'm trading back until you know the later teens to mid twenties area, I don't even look at Byron Murphy personally. Yeah. Um, unless something comes Especially out that the kid got sold fast. Out serious cash for a nickel. Right. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Another reason why. <laughs> Granted, they could play him outside. Yeah. Uh, but the third guy on, on the board here that I've seen in a lot of mocks is a guy by the name of DeAndre Baker, the corner out of Georgia. Another guy with not great size, 5'11", 193, so he's a little bit bigger. He's got longer yeah. arms, though, than either of these two prospects. On, on him, but 185? Yeah. Uh, they, it depends. Yeah. They fluctuate weights yeah. all the time. But uh, he also yeah. runs a 4'5", so Walter he's not... Football again? <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> he also runs a four five two, so he's again not the fastest. He did, however, yeah. run a little bit slower at the combine than he should have. Scouts, mm-hmm. scouts expected that he is faster than that combine forty time. Mm-hmm. So there is something to look forward to there. Uh, another solid, excuse me, mm-hmm. another solid tackler. He's able to pick the ball off. He's able to lay some big hits on every now and then. Um, but another guy that could potentially slide in the first round, uh, you know, cor- it's not a good draft for corners. It's just I, not. I will say with DeAndre Berger, though, like a lot of similar, he's got, he is similar to Brian Murphy in the way that he does play bigger than his size. He has a very small frame, but what where he where he does uh, stray from the Brian Murphy type is he actually strives in man to man coverage. Yes, he does. As evidence in his play in Georgia. Oh, he's he's, in his great he's got skills. really good closing speed. Yeah. he. he it, he prevents sep- receiver mm-hmm. separation like the best of them. Yeah. Um, a lot of comparisons that I've seen, you know, there's a lot of similarities in the style of play and the type of corner they are to Denzel Ward, yeah. uh, the, the breakout star mm-hmm. from Ohio State. A lot of similarities in, in that respect. It's just our team's going to be willing to throw him out against a guy who's got like 40 pounds on him. Right. Like, well, they're all going to gain weight when they get into the league no matter what. Um, just based on the workout regimen that they go through, yeah. the diet change, they're all going to gain weight. One eighty five is really small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's not a it's big that's not a big player. And all three <laughs> of these guys are right around that mm-hmm. mark. So you're going to expect to see him move up into the one ninety range somewhere around there, one ninety plus. Another name that he's compared to quite a bit is uh, Bills cornerback Tredavious White. Interesting. Yes, uh, he's got good speed and athleticism. Again, good closing speed. He doesn't run. He didn't run the forty well, but scouts expected that. As I mentioned, he does have long arms, though. Thirty-two inch arms is longer than the both of them. Yet he's smaller than Greedy Williams, so he's a guy that you can look at as being. You know, there could be some surprises with where these corners go, because a guy like Byron Murphy is going to go to a team that's looking for a solid slot corner. That's what Byron Murphy's going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a guy, a guy like DeAndre Baker could potentially even jump over Greedy Williams. But you also could go, you know, straight vanilla and take Greedy Williams and, you know, let the rest of the cornerback board go the way it's supposed to. But anything can happen here with these corners because we really don't know who is the best ball, and they all have their deficiencies and very clear deficiencies, and they all have their strengths as well. So anything could happen in this in this position group in the, when it comes to the draft. All right, move on to linebackers. Let's do it. All right, this is probably my favorite guy for the Lions, day one, if he can follow us at eight, of all position groups. I'll tell you um, right now, this guy's going top five. I, know. But I hate to say it, but he is. Devin White out of LSU, 6 feet, 237, ran a four four two forty, nearly a 40-inch vertical jump. The guy has elite speed, elite quickness, great athleticism. He is hands down one of the best Ground covering linebackers that we've seen in a draft in, in quite some time. And that's because I mean, he was a converted running back. Exactly. He, I mean, he covers so much ground, sideline to sideline. He's one of the best coverage linebackers. He's the best coverage linebacker in this draft. He's able to, he's a do it all kind of linebacker. I absolutely love this guy, and I'd yeah. love to see the Lions grab him. I just don't think he's going to go there. I think this guy's top five talent easily. Yeah. Easily. R- really, the only, uh, the only real knock on him is his play tends to be a bit erratic. Like, he, like Scott saying he needs to get control. He needs be to kind of more hone, in control. He needs to hone his motor in a little yeah, bit. He's got exactly. a very high motor, and he lets that get the best of him sometimes. Because he goes with a full head of steam, he'll fight right. for some fakes and misdirections. Yeah. And um, the one really nice thing about him, though, is he's a guy who is 
movable. Yeah. He, you can move him around interior, exterior. He prefers to play the interior, but he's able to play in a multiple defense set. Yeah. So he plays very well in a 4-3 or a 3-4 on the inside. Uh, for the Lions, it'll be interesting to see how that matches up with Jared Davis being there. So if they, you know, in the 3-4, I can absolutely see him lining up right alongside Jared Davis. I'd be curious to see what they do in a 4-3. But you're looking at one of the more sure linebackers in this yeah. draft here, if not the most sure player in this draft. Again, he's a do-it-all type of player with elite speed, athleticism, and and ability, skill, smarts, all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of comparisons to in terms of how much they cover ground to a guy like Leighton Vander Esch from last year who was an absolute stud for the Cowboys. Yeah. He's able to just cover all over the field and do it all. He he's, makes a lot of tackles. He gets in the way of passes, breaks them up. He forces fumbles. He even gets into the backfield and stops the run and hits the quarterback when he's called upon. This guy can do anything you ask him to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if the Lions were to grab him at you know number eight, that's a can't miss. That that's an absolute A plus oh, grade in my mind. Absolutely, that's why I'm hoping there's a big run on quarterbacks and DNs and to start the draft. I agree. <laughs> Let's him fall to us. But um, yeah, this is this is my favorite prospect for the Lions in this draft. But um, the other linebacker prospect that. There's, there are, actually, even his potential line taking him at eight, and I'll say it's a bit of a reach. I, I think he's more of an early teens prospect. I would say I would agree with um, you. He's, he's an early teens kind of prospect. Is Devin Bush, linebacker out of Michigan. Now, Devin Bush is an interesting prospect because he has, he has this great ability to cover tight ends. He's a high motor, great speed. In my opinion, the but, best defensive player on Michigan's defense last year. But he is a bit undersized. He is. Five he's 5'11", 234. Um, he, he's also had some tackling issues in Michigan, some focus issues. But um, if he – it's – like I want like I want to say if he can hone in that tackling, he can be an elite linebacker in the NFL. But I'm trying to think of how many 5'11 linebackers – like how many great 5'11 linebackers we've there's seen in the There's not that many. I mean – there's there's really not that many. Uh, you know, linebackers are normally around that six feet, six foot one, yeah. six two range. Um, he is a guy that can, you know, drop into pass coverage, play some zone. He he is a good coverage linebacker. He can help out in those intermediate range routes to cover the middle of the field as well as even get to the sideline. He is quite fast. He's got very good sideline to sideline speed. He's got a good athleticism. He's mm-hmm. he's a leader on the field as well. He can you know help out in that respect. Uh, it, but you're right. If he were taller, he would be mm-hmm. arguably up there with the Devin Whites on the board yeah. because he is. And if but he then, is, was a little bit more of a sure tackler as but, well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that like that's probably like the biggest part. But he yeah. has great instincts. He's just got to execute. And like, because what I sit here and wonder is. Like Devin White literally has an inch on um on Devin Bush. Other than that, I mean they they basically have the same measurables. Like they have the same arm length, about the same weight, same hand size. So you, you, you gotta wonder if they have almost if they have very similar quickness and agility, you gotta wonder how much of a difference an inch is Zach gonna make. Zach Thomas is five eleven, by the way. Interesting. So like at the same time you gotta wonder how much of a difference an inch is gonna make. So I don't know. It's really more the, the tackling issue that that does really worry me a bit about Devin Bush, but it's not it's not going to work. And clearly, the height doesn't worry people enough to to uh, scare him away from drafting him early because he's been mocked anywhere from the late single digits to the high teens. I mean, right. So the, the, those are two knocks. I just don't know. At least the height thing. I don't know how big of a knock it is. I'm a little more worried about the tackling. I would agree that tackling mm-hmm. is a little bit more important mm-hmm. because, again, he's able to use his, you know, he's able to do what he, he plays bigger than he is. Yeah. He's able to make plays with his size, mm-hmm. you know, with the lack of size. But sometimes that lack of size can also be a mm-hmm. knock against him because of the fact that he isn't as sure of a tackler as he could be. Well, the, the, you know, the length isn't there. You do have, because then this is what you're hoping he picks up in the NFL is unlike, unlike Devin White, where it's six feet. He's still shane tackles. Devin White's playing like a five level linebacker. He's getting London he, Fletcher was five ten. He he tends to get engulfed by uh, by blockers and he, he gets like a bigger blocker. He has a tough time shedding, and you would hope that much like some other guys we talked about that he plays bigger than his size. But that's that's why the knock on that on his size exists is because Devin Devin Bush doesn't really play bigger than his size. Right. But 
you would hope that it's something he can pick up in the NFL. Now, he is one of those guys that is able to move around as well. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious to see how you know defenses use mm-hmm. him in the NFL because of the lack of size. Mm-hmm. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah. Um, but he is a good prospect. He's a guy I wouldn't mind the Lions trading back mm-hmm. in the draft into those mid-teens area. You agree he's a reach at eight? Oh, yeah, I think he's a reach at eight. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's, I think if you take Devin Bush at eight, it's a mistake because if he's there at eight, there's a very good possibility that someone like a you know, a Montez Sweat mm-hmm. or a Rashawn Gary, his teammate, or someone in that range is in the, is, is there at eight as well. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, I would rather have those guys than Devin Bush right now, even yeah. though I will say I did think Devin Bush was the best player on defense for the University of Michigan last year. Yeah, I should agree with you there. I will agree with you there. All right, anything else to add on the linebackers? Um, no. Okay. Jatavis Brown from the Chargers is 5 All right, we get the point. <laughs> Zaire, oh, Zaire, Zaire Anderson from the Broncos is 5 you, You've gone Elvis to a Elvis Dumerville is 5 You've gone into a wormhole. <laughs> I'm, I was actually curious. What are some names of some smaller mm-hmm. linebackers? And I'm finding mm-hmm. some interesting ones yeah. here. Jeremy Cash is 6 feet tall. But those are all guys that play bigger than 5'11". And that's what we're talking about with Devin Bush. Is he yeah. still tends to get engulfed by blocks. and He does, yeah. yes. And has tackling issues, and that's that's something you would expect of guys five eleven. Yes, but um, let's move on to these Pistons. <laughs> so, oh yikes! I'm gonna start with this. All right, Blake Blake looks torn up. Um, torn up. The man's literally just a shell. I don't. Know. We're, He's a shell of what he was to begin the you year. You and I were watching the game yesterday, and we both. <laughs> We're looking like, can we please get this man off the floor? He, yeah, the guy was jogging at like 1.5 miles an hour. It, it looked ugly. In although even like in Oklahoma City, even though he put up 45 points, he, it's not like he was doing that. He was doing his it normal way. Right. He was doing it by his, being able to hit the jump his shot. Jump, his jumpers were going down. Yes. And, and against Charlotte, that wasn't the case. Well, it wasn't the case because he didn't have the legs. Yeah. You. Could tell he wasn't jumping well, he as high the, to hit the shot. He didn't have the legs at OKC either, but I well, he had enough legs to get the jump shot there. Yeah. In terms of the Charlotte game, he was missing mm-hmm. everything short. Yeah, he was hitting front rim on mm-hmm. everything, and it was obvious that he just wa- he didn't have the legs to get the ball there. He he struggled immensely because of that, and you could tell that it was be- all because of the knee. He, he was limping up and down the court. You saw that giant brace he had on that knee in that game. I mean, mm-hmm. that was that looked ugly. He. Looked honestly, I I couldn't even say that he looked even sixty percent of of what he is. And if if you're gonna have Blake Griffin at sixty percent for the rest of the way, can you argue playing him at that point? Sixty percent Blake Griffin. Do you like? Because we got we got who do we have up? We have Memphis. I'd, I'd argue you Knicks. need at least seventy percent of Blake Griffin to be. It's a conundrum because these are two must win games coming up, and obviously, um, but at the same time against bad teams. But so it's like. Well, do you they say, also set Blake against the Cavs and lost. Exactly. So, do you say rest Blake off, assuming you're going to win, make the playoffs, or do you put that, or are you putting that playoff? I think it's, I think it's a Jeopardy. wait and see kind of thing. How does Blake feel? Is he at least seventy five percent of what he normally is? If he's not, I think you got to sit him. You know, at yeah. least don't start him. He did say he feels better today than he did yesterday. Well, that's, that's good. That's what we got. That's good. And then again, Dwayne Casey does say it's not going to get any worse. Okay. Which makes zero sense <laughs> yeah. to me. But if you aren't getting at least 70 75% of Blake Griffin, I don't think you can make an argument of playing him. It, it, just because of the fact that a guy who's playing that hurt does not help you on either end of the floor. Yeah. He He's inefficient on offense, missing shots, and when he's taking long shots and missing them short, that leads to long rebounds, which leads to fast breaks. Yeah. And you don't want that because then you're always playing four on five no matter what because the guy can't defend anybody mm-hmm. with the knee the way it is. I he needs to be at least seventy five to eighty percent for me to play him. Yeah. I, I you you need to be able to tell me that. And if he's if I see him out there hobbling around again, I need to sit him down and say you're done. Because one, we need you for the playoffs. Two, you're not helping us right now. I know you're the best player on this team. I know how badly you want it right now. But you aren't helping this team do what it needs to do to make the playoffs right now. Mm-hmm. You need to rest up. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about the playoffs. Now we got Blake Griffin out of the way. Both the Nets and the Magic have clinched a playoff spot. Yes. Pistons are the only team that have not. Yes. Uh, and they're fighting with Charlotte right now. Now, 
we could still pretend. And Miami, I still believe, is technically in it. I don't think Miami is technically eliminated Yeah, yet. but they're all but eliminated. Their they, match number's one. They need us. They basically need us to lose both our games. Yes. They need to win both our, both yes. our games. So, and <laughs> The Pistons' yeah. magic number is at one. They need a win to get in, is basically what we're looking at. I, so, according to CBS, it's two. I'm trying to do the math in my head here, but this is as of a few hours ago. Two. Because, so what they're saying... They don't so, need a team to lose to get in. They just need a win. Exactly. Well, I think it's because Charlotte's one, only one game behind, and they have the tiebreaker on us. That's why. But we only need one win to get in. That was That's the scenario, is we need one win to get in. Well, if we only win one, and Charlotte wins two... But they, they only have one game left. No, they have two games left. I don't think that's yeah. an updated, updated standing. Because I literally read today that I'm pretty sure they only need one to get in. They, they have two games left. Charlotte has two games remaining. Don't believe me? <laughs> no, I don't. Actually, because what I read earlier is not does not yeah, say they got that. the Cavs. And they have the Magic, and they're one game behind us with the tiebreaker. That's that's match number two. Hang so, on. with that being said, knowing that the that the Pistons really because I I these are not exactly super tough games for the for the Hornets either. They should be able to beat the Cavs. The Magic are mediocre. These aren't exact. These are both very winnable games for the Hornets. It's really looking like the Pistons need to win both these games. Are you live? Over I'm, no, I'm listening. <laughs> What's your confidence level in the Pistons being able to make the playoffs? Knowing this? it's not high. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It was sky high. I, I was in a, in a situation I mean, last week where I was 99 just exactly. last week. Like, in a situation last week where I was saying I don't think there's a scenario where the Pistons don't make the playoffs, but I also didn't expect them to lose four straight games. Yeah. I mean, I expect them to at least split with Indiana. Mm-hmm. I expect them to at least. You know, beat Charlotte, even yeah. though they haven't at all this year. Mm-hmm. I expected them to win at least one game, yeah. and if that were to happen, I'd have a lot of confidence. But mm-hmm. it didn't. So now you're looking at a situation where the Pistons need help. Almost they mm-hmm. not necessarily, but they do need to mm-hmm. clinch this division themselves. Yeah. They need a win out to clinch on their own. Yes. Well, mm-hmm. how, I don't think that's accurate because the the Hornets needed to win out to make the playoffs. They could not lose against the Pistons the other night. Yeah. Exactly. They, they needed the to Pistons, win so. out for the Pistons for them to get in. So again, the Hornets are one game behind us. Both teams have two games remaining. Hornets have the tiebreaker. Sure, the Hornets are one and a half. They're one game behind us. No, they are one game. Yeah. They're playing a lot better basketball than we are. That's yeah. <laughs> so um, hang on a second here. I'm getting the actual. I'm giving you two. This is so um. So yesterday. with that being said. If the Pistons do end up winning both these games, which you would hope they can do against Memphis and, and the Magic the had to lose one, they can get a seven. No, I know, but is what I'm saying? Yeah, if the Magic can lose one of these games, which who do the Magic have? They're the Hornets and who else? I have no idea. I have um, no idea. <laughs> Magic school bus. That's not <laughs> what I want. <laughs> so, uh, oh, they only have one game. They just had the Hornets. That's not good. So, um, yeah, the Magic took down the Celtics yesterday. So they have one game left against the Hornets. So, best case scenario, Magic's finish, Magic finished 42 and 40. Yeah, you need them to lose. You need the Magic to lose. Magic basically. If you want the seven seed, yeah. Yes. Magic clinch seven seed. You have, no, the only win. scenario for the Pistons to get the seven seed is if the Pistons win out in the I'm Magic. Saying, lose. The Magic clinch seven seed with a win. Yes. Um, against Charlotte. So, either, either Charlotte's knocking right at your door or Magic clinch seven seed. It's like a lose lose scenario in this game. But, um. Okay, no, it is two. Yeah. So, uh,. And Pistons, obviously, scenarios we, for the Pistons get in. Pistons go yeah. one and one, and Hornets go one and one. Pistons yeah. get in. Charlotte goes two and zero, oh and Pistons go one and one. Charlotte gets in based on porno this. record against Pistons. <laughs> um, Pistons go one and one. Hornets go one and Pistons are in. Yes, better record. Pistons win both games. They're in. Yeah, we, we've established so. this. But um, anyways, so we said on the show that our ideal spot for the Pistons is number seven to take on the Raptors because that's the team we've I'll be seen honest the with best you. track. I'll be honest with, with you. I I, I think I they're looking at I think they're the set the seven seeds kind of on the horizon. It's gone. It, I don't disagree. We need the we need to win out and the match to lose. It's not even yeah, in our hands. No, anymore. it's not. But that, that's what I was trying to get at. I, is if I'm the, the Pistons, it's, not because you know we finished. Not the seven seed is 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 all but unreachable because you need help to get there. Do we win a single game if we were to make the playoffs? Do we win a single game against the Bucks? Did they win a single game against Bucks the regular season? I don't think so. No. <laughs> There's your answer. No. Okay. The Bucks are playing. By the way, they hit 60 wins, which is something that we a question I was asked, follow, and follow, I said yes, yes they would. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But the Bucks oh, are you playing. Went back on that, 
But, <laughs> Whatever. but the Bucks are playing excellent mm-hmm. basketball. Yeah. Their home record is ridiculous. The mm-hmm. road record's very good. Yeah. There's, they're the best team in basketball in the Pistons, and they absolutely own the Pistons. The Pistons have no answer for Giannis Antetokounmpo. Pistons get swept in four in, in not even close fashion. So here is my money, my money ball question for you here. What, is more, what would be a more annoying conclusion this season to you? Pistons back the way into the eighth seed and get swept by the Bucks, or miss the playoffs but at least level lottery. Miss pick. the playoffs. That'd be the more annoying Yes. Thing. Want to know why? Because you only got a w- less than 1% shot to get the number one pick. <laughs> that would literally just delegitimize everything that this team has done over the last three years. Everything that they traded for Blake Griffin to make the playoffs. And then last year when they missed it, they said, oh, Blake wasn't healthy for 60 games. Okay? Reggie wasn't healthy. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you had them all this year. Everybody was healthy this year. Everybody. Playing yeah. at some at a certain point in time this season, playing some of the best basketball we've ever seen, mm-hmm. and honestly, you've had the best Blake Griffin has ever been mm-hmm. most of this season. Yeah, and you cool. still couldn't make the playoffs in an Eastern Conference where the seven seed might be a five hundred team. The problem is the the team's best basketball and Blake Griffin's best basketball never aligned. That was the other thing. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. You're not wrong. I'm not making excuses. I'm just pointing that out. But but um, at the same time. Mm-hmm. This is what this organization was waiting for this mm-hmm. season. The stars to align where Blake's healthy, Dre's healthy, Reggie's healthy, everybody's good to go. You got an, a coach of the year winning coach. Mm-hmm. Everything's in line for you. Mm-hmm. And you still miss the playoffs. Mm-hmm. That literally mm-hmm. just destroys any belief that this team can be anything more than a lottery team at the back end. Yeah, you, you took your – because we we had been pretty vocal – pre-trade deadline that we wanted this team to try to bottom out and get a high draft pick this year. You end up trying to take a shot. We're like, okay, let's see where this goes. You took your shot. As of right now, you failed that shot. This is, in my opinion now, this is what, what you're telling me is this is peak performance for this Pistons basketball team. So what it screams to me is it's time for a top-down rebuild. Uh, top-down starting <laughs> with the damn owner. <laughs> I'd be the if the Pistons miss the playoffs as a as a diehard you're Pistons maxed fan. Out, you're maxed as a out. diehard Pistons fan, mm. if they miss the playoffs this year, I am furious. Yep. Furious. You're maxed out in salary. You built this team the way you wanted to, mm. with the hope of making the playoffs and and bringing playoff basketball back to Detroit. You mm. came down here for the mentality change to try to bring a winning atmosphere, and you maxed yourselves out. Give yourself no flexibility for years to come, and you still, still finish ninth in an Eastern Conference, which is historically bad. Historically bad. That Magic team doesn't make the playoffs any other year. They usually 500 makes you the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. Yes, but those teams are better. Yeah. This is a bad I mean, Eastern Conference. You know what's even worse? Magic clincher division. <laughs> You may this may be the worst that may be the worst division in basketball or in sports. It's the worst division in sports. Oh, man. It's honestly it's embarrassing is what it is. You did all of this to get yourself the last possible lottery pick. Yeah. Why not just blow it up and tank it at that, that, that those point? Those are basically two options. It, it, it shows that you just pick or eighth or uh or Making plays in the AC against probably the best team. It shows a gross miscalculation and a delusion on the part of the front office and ownership that this team could be anything more than trash. Damn. (laughs) I think the mic just exploded. Yeah. Drop the fucking (laughs) mic. That's what. Sorry. Language. Jesus. I can't control the language. But um, I'm angry, okay? We were sitting at the sixth seed, and this whole season turned, and this whole season looked wonderful. And then all of a sudden, they played the Heat and the Nets in back to back games, and <laughs> ever since, ever those since, two games were the two that just destroyed it all. Yeah. It's, it's not been good ever since then. You got losses after that. You lost. I think they've Cleveland. won like four games since. They've won five. five Woohoo! Games. We got LA. <laughs> Uh, Toronto, Phoenix, Orlando, and Portland. Wow. Very up and down, to be honest with you, but in terms of difficulty. Uh, didn't Portland not even have McCollum in that game? Because I know no, they, they just did. got him back. No, they did. Oh, they okay. Regardless, I thought they did. regardless, it's embarrassing. 
And I'll tell you right now, these fans should be lining up to start a GoFundMe to buy the team away from Tom Goris because he's ruined this organization. Well, they didn't, actually. You're right. They didn't have McCollum. I was going to say they didn't have McCollum for a while. They just got him back. Because Goris cannot have anything to do with basketball operations if you want a team to be anything better than a nine seed. Yeah, oh, I agree. He's embarrassing on the microphone, <laughs> embarrassing on TV, and embarrassing when it comes to making decisions in this in this time? organization. No! Guy can't even throw! <laughs> Let alone stand up because he can't even stay sober to watch this team play some nights. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, yeah, I don't know where the Pistons go from here, though, with their salary cap situation and... I think you're going to have at least one more year of futility before we can really start doing something. I will say one thing. With their current draft pick and their salary cap situation, you're going to have another year of this. I will say one anything. thing. Next year could begin, we could begin seeing the light at the end of this tunnel of mediocrity. Yeah, you're not gonna, I'm saying you're not going to have any major changes for another year. So. No, you could have major changes next year because you have like four expiring deals that are tradable. Reggie's contract becomes oh, tradable. Oh yeah, yeah. If you yeah, I was just the light the, at the be, at I'm the end of the tunnel starts showing itself. Moves to see this off season to start next year. So you can still about, do that because you not. have expiring deals next year. You have Reggie's contract is expiring. Those expiring deals are more enticing in the, at the deadline. Right? They are, but they're still them. enticing in the off season as well. They there's something that you can you know use to get extra draft capital. Yeah. You know, you can swing your first round pick and an expiring deal to maybe move up two or three picks. So instead of picking 16, Mm -hmm. you're picking 12 like you would have been last year. Yeah, it's something that is it's at least something positive and you take some money off the books, which is really good. (laughs) So there is some flexibility in this offseason because of Mm -hmm. that. But at that point, you're embracing the tank. Mm hmm. And which honestly, do, which I don't think happens with current ownership. That's the problem. Sell the team. <laughs> yeah, wish we could just let them sell the team. But <laughs> I'll start the GoFundMe. We got enough money sell in the city, the right? City. <laughs> yes. Sell to we'll, the people. We'll be the next Green Bay Packers Can organization. You imagine that. Oh my God. God, with this city, we have town I, hall I, meetings about the Pistons. We're very <laughs> passionate here, and we are very polarizing on what on how we want to run our teams. I'll be honest. If the team was ran by the people, first of all, you would find a way in. Second of all, you'd probably be in jail within a year. Oh, I. <laughs> oh no, I'd be in and I'd be on top. <laughs> no, like, I, don't get me wrong. I want this team to make the playoffs. Yeah. I want them to make the seven seed. I want it so badly. Mm-hmm. I want to see playoff basketball here. I'll go buy a ticket to watch a game mm-hmm. in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I I need it. I need playoff basketball back in the city. And not just the four games against the Cavs three years ago. As fun as those games were, but sure, fun games. I, those against the Bucks, those won't be fun there games. Won't be fun, no. <laughs> no, but I want playoff basketball. I want this team to succeed. But if this team falls into that nine spot and misses the playoffs with the way that they've set this team and built this team up, I have no justification mm-hmm. for keeping the train moving. Yeah, none whatsoever. And, it, and at that point, I tell you, this off season. You have no way to go but burn it down. Yeah. Because if you try to sell us on another year where we're going to go make the playoffs, dude, how delusional are you? Mm -hmm. How grossly miscalculated are you on thinking that this team can be anything at all? Because this was your best opportunity. Everybody was healthy. You weren't going to win anything, but... It was your best opportunity to show that you at least had something a going. A pulse. Yeah. A pulse in this city. <laughs> this was your best opportunity. You've gotten the best basketball out of Andre Drummond mm-hmm. in years. Ever, even. You've gotten the best basketball that Blake Griffin has ever played in his career. Mm-hmm. You got the best basketball out of Reggie Jackson since 2016. Mm-hmm. You got the best basketball out of Ish Smith in the last couple of months that I've ever seen. He didn't even play mo- most of last year anyways. Mm-hmm. All around, as a team, you've gotten some of the best basketball you've had in years, and this is what it gets you. Like, that's embarrassing. That, that, that ownership, Goris, the front office, they should be embarrassed at that point. Mm-hmm. Oh, I agree. Because that shows that it was an obvious, that it was nothing more than an obvious delusion on your part 
not to just blow it up to begin with. And you got John Lure, the guy who threw big money at two years ago. You, you might as well have the wakey wacky inflatable at least that's arm an expi- At least man. that is an expiring <laughs> deal starting next season. I'm happy about that. You got John Lures. You got a lot of money in expiring deals next year that you can mm. move. Lure, Reggie, there's, there's $27 million right there. Yeah, but it's not until next year. But yeah. This offseason. Yeah. Starting this offseason. How many teams take Reggie? I think that there's definitely a team out there that will take Reggie. Lord. <laughs> Depends how badly they want an expiring deal. Yes. All right. Uh, let's go into some brighter pastures here. Uh, reminisce in the days of yore. Uh, <laughs> so. <sighs> Time for some I mean, last, last week, the Pistons honored the bad boys. But, uh, and we thought about, you know, maybe we can, you know, talk about the bad boys a little bit. But, like. Then we realized that we're, we're like, only 25, disin- yeah, almost 26 years old. It'd be disingenuous. We didn't live through the bad boys. We didn't live through the bad boys. We saw the bad boys in suits, one of which destroying an organization in Isaiah Thomas, Mm -hmm. and the other one building building championships and then then destroying an organization (laughs) here with Joe Dumars. I feel feel like Dumars should be watching that. And and we saw Bill Lambeer win a WNBA championship. Can I throw a PSA real quick? Can can business fans get over like the last few years of Dumars' reign? And just really and realize. So I'm gonna be honest with you. And well, let me finish. And realize how much that man has brought to the. I'm gonna be honest with you. All three championships, he had something to do with directly. Dude, why, why can't we pay him his due respect? Dude, like it's not the fans anymore. It's him. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. refuses to cross the bridge. He refuses mm-hmm. to extend the olive, olive branch. Well, I know fans have the, asked him to come back. The a majority of fans in the organization have asked him to come back. The, we love you. The organization, you're a bad boy for life. The organization itself has asked him to come back, but from everything so I've heard, so have fans. I know, but from everything I've heard, the vitriol has gone from fans, so it stopped them from coming back. Okay, That's, many years, like yeah. four, five, six, seven years ago. Mm-hmm. That's that's over. The last two to three years, it's been nothing but love. I've heard nothing but love for Joe D. Mm-hmm. Please come back. We want you back. We want you here. Mm-hmm. Come celebrate with your former teammates. Come celebrate with your brothers. Come mm-hmm. celebrate with your fans. He refuses. I mean, they got, that's on Joe D, mm-hmm. man. They got that's Den- on Joe D. They got Dennis Robin on North Korea. <laughs> But that's not on the fans. Yeah. The fans have given up that shtick. Can we unretire? That's on Joe D. Can we unretire and then re-retire his jersey so he can come to the <laughs> retirement <center? laughs> He probably won't even do that because he refuses to come back. Do you think there's any way we ever see Jody in the palace again? No, because palace is being torn down. Oh, I mean, sorry, that's palace. Wow. <laughs> do you think we? Okay, sorry. Let me rephrase. Do you think there's any way we see Joe D back in the eyes of the organization again? Make an appearance in front of the fans again. If Joe D is willing to get the stick out of his ass, sure. That's what this is. He's he's being a petty little bitch about it. I love Joe Dumars, but he needs to grow up here. Fans have accepted him back and welcomed him back. He refuses. Now, speaking, speaking of people who haven't really been around, what's happened with Rasheed Wallace? Why he's got is his he, own thing. He does like a world tour. You I know, know that? But like, why has he not been participating in any of like the team events that like, or, like revolve around the old four Pistons? I don't know. I, don't ask me. I mean, he's Weird. his family he doesn't represented want to him. Be in 2K, like he's just okay. Like, he's <laughs> never wanted to. He's never yeah, been a big part of the player association 2K yeah, no, thing. No, like no, he's never like that. Um, but there's you know there's a lot of names that are like that. I mean, Barry Bonds is like that in yeah. in uh, you know the old ML, MLB. I just want to see the five of them together again, man. I just want to see all five. I do too. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, the going to work crew was our. Version of the big boys. It was or bad, bad boys. boys, big boys, <laughs> bad boys. It, it was our version of that. Yep. It was the rough, tough, dirty. Mm-hmm. You That's know, what we grew up watching. Go to work every single mm-hmm. night. Early play your hardest. Of watching Pistons basketball with the teal years with Stackhouse, Grant Hill, which were not the John greatest. Barry, which were not but, the greatest. Uh, yeah, not the greatest. Still Jody. <laughs> you still had John Lindsay Barry in the red, white, and blue. Yeah, but um, the earlier years, but red, white, and blue, and teal years overlapped. But uh, the, yeah. oh, I'm thinking of the actual red jerseys that they had. No, but, um, the actual red, yeah, white, and blue when, but, they turned, um, when they changed the jersey back. So, but yeah, the my prime memories. John Barry was the most generic looking yeah, guy yeah. on a, a basketball mm-hmm. player. He, he and that guy from the that backup point guard from the Lakers that almost dunked on Gobert the other night, dude. That guy's got heart mm-hmm. and stones. <laughs> But, How are you going to dunk on Gobert? <laughs> my, my fondest memory of the Pistons is easily the, the going to work crew. The, the team that won the 4 championship, the team that made six straight conference championships. Um, it's it's my I would argue that it like just for me personally, it is it, my favorite it's Detroit my sports favorite team. Detroit sports team ever. It, 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 there's no doubt about it. It's the 
team that I saw the most continued success with not named the Red Wings. And I'm not, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest hockey fan. Mm-hmm. I like hockey. I love the Red Wings. I love watching them play that 0-2 team. I remember living through that mm-hmm. and seeing that team play. Greatest sports team it put together in the history of sports. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you that. Yeah. By the way, we're doing this because the Pistons honored the 04 Pistons well, for championship team obviously. on Sunday. But, but what, what the heck? Mm-hmm. Um, but... I never really aligned myself with a lot of those guys because they were just rentals. I mean, yeah. they, they brought them in to win a title. They bought yeah. a championship with that team. Mm-hmm. You don't get eight to nine Hall of Famers on your team without buying them. <laughs> Something's going on with our speakers. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, but so the going to work crew was my team. Yeah, that was my team Agreed. that I grew up with. I loved watching them. I had Chauncey's jersey. I had Ben's jersey. Mm-hmm. I had you know Pistons warm ups as a kid that I used to go out into the driveway and tear off mm-hmm. with my jersey on underneath and shoot hoops. I mean, it, I used to have so much fun pretending I was playing with Rip Hamilton, Chauncey, Ben, Rasheed, Tayshawn, like Corliss me, Williamson. For me, it Memo. felt like every I love game. Memo. For me, it felt like every single game was an event. Like that's how much like. I loved watching that team. but Dude, it was that, a tradition yeah. in my house. My dad and I would go and sit in our back living room, mm-hmm. and we'd watch every game, every single night. Yeah. And when we got to go, it was a treat. Like, it was a real treat to be able to go to the mm-hmm. Palace and watch that team play because the energy was there because they sold out every single game for, the, for like, six years. When's the last time mm-hmm. the, this arena sold out, if <laughs> ever? I mean, technically, I think they almost sold out Little Caesars Arena for the bringing that team back. Yeah, which we kind of played going to. We, ended up we did uh, uh, contemplate it, but we ended up not. Um, but anyway, so what were, your, were some of your favorite memories with your favorite team? So one that sticks out to me. I mean, I, you, I could go really easy with this. Not the it, two obvious ones. I could go mm-hmm. really easy, obviously, the, raising the trophy, winning mm-hmm. the championship, and the other one would be the Tayshaun block. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite memories, though, 2004 Eastern Conference Finals. New this Jersey is one Nets. Of the two obvious ones I was looking at. But. New, the New Jersey <laughs> Nets. Pistons down three. Game end of the five. game. Game five. And Chauncey pulls up from half court and down, nails it off glass. Or are they down uh, 80 41? Something like that. But he pulls up from half court and nails it off, off the glass at the buzzer. Yep. As soon as he hit that shot, my arms were in the air and I was running around my house. Three point two seconds left. I, my mm-hmm. mom was pissed. So I did the same thing. I started running around my house. So basically, what happened? I was watching with my dad, and then he's same. Like, he goes and like it was. Like they called the time. Like it was like, like call time. I was commercial break. Three seconds left. Um, she didn't even call time out, but um, it was commercial break. Three seconds left. My dad changes the channel. Like, what are you doing? He goes, "It's over. It's done. What do you, what do you want?" And I'm like, "No, there's still three seconds left." He goes, "You have to go the whole court. You're not going to do it." And I'm like, "Just change the channel." <laughs> so he changes the channel back, and just in time for the for the play. Sean sees the shot. I get up. I just scream bloody murder. Just run around the house. Run upstairs and start running around every <laughs> single bedroom in the house. And I was like, what's going on? And I'm like, Chauncey, that good shot. Chauncey, that good shot. Dude. I'm like out of breath, just like running laps around I my house. I was sprinting <laughs> around my house with my hands in the air, screaming. My mom's going, what the hell? down there my dad's got my dad just doing spinning in circles in the living room with his hands up i'm like oh my god this is amazing i know they lost the game in triple overtime but it was one of the best moments fucking brian scalabrine that, yeah Sorry. i know <laughs> i can't say his name without cursing but that like that moment was just like that was the first time Such I ever saw that man. Great moment in <laughs> Pistons history. I just I can't get over it. But, I just um, I all, when I think about that team, that's one of the first things that pops into my head. Oh man, I love that day. Some other some other great moments. So like, first of all, I Rashid loved, three quarter of the court shot. That was beautiful. <laughs> and then you had the, I remember uh, Rip had nice buzz beat against the Celtics. Did, yes. like a 0.3 three seconds off from the clock. Mm-hmm. It was a sideline three. But um, anyway, I I loved how much character like. A lot of my memories are associated with basically the characters that this team had. Like, how you had, in general, the, the team had their own sound effect with the horn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then... Um, now, a lot of teams have the train whistle, but yeah, just different but, variations. Um, but you had, uh, for example, you had Ribs, Yezer. You yes, had, sir! You had, you had Sheed's You know the origins of that, Sheed. right? You know actually, the, the origins. Actually don't. So, the had, origins of the Big Yes, bands, sir. Like, the clock tower thing. Like, everyone had right. their own thing. The and origins of the Yes, sir... Was if you recall the ceremony at the beginning of the 2004 2005 season when they were raising the banner, mm-hmm. um, it might have either been that or the trophy ceremony because they won on their home. It was the trophy ceremony because mm-hmm. they won on their home floor when Rip got on the mic when they were getting the trophy. 
on their home floor, thanking the fans and all that. He grabbed the mic and all in literally the first like 30 seconds of a speech where, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like he did it for 30 seconds straight. And that's where that came from. That's the origins of the yes, sir. And then mm-hmm. obviously, but going back to the, the character, I mean, you had the fear of the fro. You had yeah. blah, blah, and you knew Fuck. no matter where he was in the stadium, mm-hmm. no matter where he was in that arena, if there was, if he was sitting at the end of the bench, <laughs> you could always yeah. hear blah, blah, One of my favorite things. Do you remember, <laughs> the one, remember the one year he came back and was part of the coaching staff? He was mm-hmm. an assistant coach. I remember in Summer League. It was like his first game in Summer League. <laughs> got, got the team misses a free league. You just hear Sheed yell from the bench, Bottle line! <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I missed this. <laughs> oh, man. But um, what else was I going to say? Um, I miss like every time she would catch the ball, the entire crowd would just yell, Sheed! <laughs> Oh, it just God, it was just. I I love to see you. You but, always knew when Rashid was playing his best basketball and when he was feeling it. Yeah, especially from outside because he'd go and step up up to the up to the perimeter and he'd have that like real high over the head, you know, over the head shot that he'd like swing back and bring it up. He, very interesting shooting form. But if you notice on nights he was feeling it, he'd shoot it both right and left handed. Mm-hmm. He'd go up and shoot it left handed, you know, same form just with his left hand. He'd come right back down the floor and do it again with his right. And I always loved watching him just go back and forth with, with his right and left hand. And honestly, thinking about it, that's extreme skill right there. How many players oh, yeah. do you know can shoot a three pointer with consistency, both left and right handed? How many players do you know that could put a spell on the ball when they shoot a free throw? <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Jason Kidd, he used to kiss it. <laughs> but I think, I think f- for me, I think one of the most defining stretches of this team, like the stretch of basketball to me that defined what this team was, was that stretch where they held 11 teams straight under teams to points. under 70 that's, That was points. ridiculous. The one game I remember in that that's streak, still if I recall, be a record. I don't right. think it's ever going to be broken. No, not in today's game. Hell yeah, no. Exactly. The way the game is going, I don't think it's ever going to be broken. But there was one game, I want to say it was in that streak, but they beat the Boston Celtics like 140 to like 67. Yeah. I just remember watching that game going, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like, if that didn't define that team to you, I don't know what will, like, well, that was what the that was what the Tayshawn Block was a defining moment, but like, right? But I'm that was what the the heart and blood of yeah. that team was was going to work on the defensive end, not letting anybody score. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need to be the best offensive team in the league if you if nobody can score on you. I mean, mm-hmm. they held some of the great offensive teams, some of the great offensive players to next to nothing. Yeah, I mean, I always loved watching Tayshawn have to guard guys like Paul Pierce, have to mm-hmm. guard guys like Tracy McGrady, Vince Carter, mm-hmm. all the greats, and he it, and he time. had the length. And he had the speed and he had the athleticism to do it. And he killed it every time. He yeah. was always fantastic guarding guys like that. He was mm-hmm. the special defender. And then uh, for me, lastly, I want to point out just the intros. The intro, I, I used to have Mason's starting five intro as a track on my MP3 player. I loved the Mason. <laughs> I, I will say this I loved the Mason intros for that team. Mm-hmm. I hate it now. Well, it's become a bit of a shtick now. Like It's, it's, a gimmick. Yeah. It's become saying. a gimmick. But the specifically with that team, especially after they won the um after they won the uh championship when Ben Wallace had that championship belt too. Well when they that, were, you know you know where they, they got those from, right? Rashid bought the whole team oh, heavyweight right. championship right. belts for the title. And uh, the whole team. <laughs> and like how uh I remember you you see him in the tunnel and Rip would always take punches to this to the gut like before they go. Like it was like a pregame ritual was someone to punch Rip in the stomach. Oh <laughs> another one that's awesome. And then, and then everyone like just thought uh, just the intros that Mason run through the fire, the final countdown. Mm-hmm. It was just all part of that atmosphere, and then you had you'd have you'd have the, you had the video the, the video board the, play with Ba with the, the Ba, hand. and then you have yeah, the the, the ben final with the countdown Ben with the hammer, and then you'd have the little cutaway on the TV cutaway where you'd have the logo and you'd have the the cartoon hammer sw- exactly blasting and into the other team's the, logo, and then it would explode, explode and, and they, the fire comes yep, out, dude. But oh Jesus! Um, but another one that I always loved me, watching, though, always that I always loved watching, xing out the numbers in the playoffs. Yeah, that was every win. At the school I remember table. when they X out the one. Yeah. That was awesome. But um one another one of my favorite ones, and this is this is something that they just did as a team. Yeah. That before every game, after the intros, 
you know, everybody's ready. They're either doing the little huddle, but their huddle's not a normal huddle. Sway. You had the sway yeah. and Rashid in the middle just going, going nuts. Yep, yep. Just going nuts. Dancing all over the place. It's, it's, I feel like we don't have that character. They anymore. don't have the energy. They don't have the character, the energy. They don't They don't love each This team doesn't love each other that way. Mm-hmm. That team loved each other like brothers every last Do one of see, them. Is there any team right now in the NBA that's that cohesive unit that has that much character that just gels like that Pistons team did? I'll turn that question around with another one. Is there a team in history that had that? Damn. Because this is one of those... How many teams can you say had zero true superstars and were that good? Mm -hmm. It was one of the most bona fide team championships of NBA history. Yeah. Because every team I can think of that every every team I can think of that went to six straight Eastern or conference championships, it went to end multiple NBA finals, won a title. Mm-hmm. Every one of those teams had a big name, mm-hmm. had a superstar, was a almost, Hall of Famer. It was almost symbolic. The team we get went against in that Lakers team that was a superstar t- stack team. Malone, that was Shaq, for super Peyton, teams. Kobe. Yeah, but, but think about it: the Rockets in the midnight, the, the Jordan with the Bulls, Pippen also, but Elijah Wan, Larry Bird, mm-hmm. Moses Malone. Bill Russell, Magic, Kareem, Kobe, Shaq, Tim Duncan. All these teams had massive players that were just studs on offense and defense. Some more than others, but the Pistons had five guys. Five guys that worked so cohesive as a unit. Honestly, 12 guys that worked so cohesive as a unit. Nobody was bigger than than anybody else. Nobody. Mm Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yes, you had Fear the Fro. Yes, you had the Garen Sheed. Yes, you had Rip, Chauncey, Mr. Big Shot, Tayshawn. But you also had guys like Memo, Corliss, although I believe he was traded for Sheed in that trade, if I recall. I don't remember. You had guys, you know, you had a group of guys that were legitimately a family, and that was one of the best parts about it was because it was the, it was kind of symbolic that, a group of average guys working together can be something. Yeah. And, and and that type of blue blood mentality in this city works better than anywhere else. Because that's what this city's about. Is hard work, blood, blood, sweat, and tears into what you do to be successful. And that's what that team was. That mentality, that character was what made that team the going to work crew that we all you know grew up loving. Yeah. And we'll never see anything like it because mm-hmm. basketball's not that way anymore. Yeah. But that was one tough ass team. Agreed. They didn't let nobody get in their way. What a send off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that'll do it for us on this episode of the podcast. Thank you for checking us out. Uh, again, we go live on Twitch every Monday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We do more uh, wide ranging topics, not just local sports. So right. feel free to check us out. Twitch.tv slash fan report. Anything else you want to add before we uh, sign off? No, just thank you guys for listening. Catch us uh, next week as well as we continue on with our draft coverage for the Lions. And uh, as we kind of get pretty close to the draft, it's starting to come up. So we'll ramp that up quite a bit before we ramp, it up, uh, ramp up in a football season as basketball winds down. But hope for some playoff basketball. Let's hope. And we'll catch you guys next week. Have a good one. Peace. Peace out. <laughs>